Welcome. Uh, this is uh, prospecting, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, it's my favorite part of DevCon because it's the beginning of the end of my responsibilities while I'm here. My name is Mark Richman. I'm the president of Skeleton Key. We're an FBA platinum partner based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, this is session BUS is it 007 or 07. Um, so hopefully you're in the right room. And we'll get started. My goal is to wrap up my talking here in 45 minutes or less. Last time I timed it, it was 44 and change. Um, I have a tendency to ad lib like I'm doing now, so I may not succeed. I also tend to talk fast, so I'm going to try to do both those things. And, uh, and then we've got microphones for Q&A at the end. I've got more questions than I have answers. Um, so hopefully when I throw out some of my questions, some of you will step up and offer some options and solutions and suggestions for the crowd. Um, if I can accommodate questions on the fly, I will. Otherwise, I'm going to jot them down right here and try to cover them at the end so we don't run out of time. So let's get going. I also wander a bit, so um, we'll see how this goes. So a uh, little bit about me. I was born in New York. I moved to Missouri in 96. Um, I launched Skeleton Key in 2004. Uh, I've got four boys, uh, which is why um, I work as hard as I do. Uh, I've been doing FileMaker for almost 30 years, I calculated yesterday, uh, which kind of shocked me because I'm only 50. I just turned 50 a couple weeks ago. I'm an entrepreneur. I have two companies under one roof. One's called Skeleton Key, does FileMaker. One's called BrightSource IT, does managed services. That'll become relevant later. Um, and I've been speaking at DevCon on and off since 2010, mostly about performance, sometimes about security, and then uh, a lot about business and just kind of trying to share what I've learned about what I don't know. Um, so this is not going to be a, here's how you prospect 100% of it. This is, here's what I think prospecting is. Here's what I'm able to do. Here's what I think I could do better. What do you guys think? What can you tell me? Uh, because it's an ongoing evolution as a business owner as to how to do what you do. So uh, my agenda, pretty simple, going to review the objectives, going to change those objectives, um, going to do a few other things along the way, and hopefully leave plenty of time at the end for us to all have a conversation, and then happy to talk afterwards or tonight as well. So this was the session objectives. They're pretty boring. I'm not going to read them to you, and I want to remind everybody that I wrote these in December. Um, I also have a tendency to pick targets and then go after them. Uh, so I didn't really know uh, what I was going to learn over the next six to eight months, but I learned quite a bit, especially about limitations on what I can actually do. And that's kind of normal for me. It's probably normal for a lot of DevCon speakers, depending on the topic. It's kind of like hiking and climbing. It's the journey, not the destination. And so that's my spin on why the objectives are about to change. So I chose this topic, um, and I'm going to explain why. That's what we're going to talk about. I, going to share what I, how I approached it. We're going to do some assessment and review of what I got out of it. Um, and then we're going to talk about what I plan to do next. And then I want to get some discussion going in the room. Ideally, there's a couple people here who have done the things I didn't do and can share their experience with the rest of us. Um, I'm kind of confident that we'll cover the same kinds of material as you may have come expecting to see. But the slides that are up on the community site are going to be a bit different than these. Um, you'll see about a third of them have probably changed. So why this topic? Um, you know, it's going to come down to two things. Uh, we're a growing company. We want to keep growing. And there's some logic in not just selling and getting leads the way we've been getting them in the past. And that um, dawned on me through the following examples. So I don't know. Ask yourself, are your people busy? And are they always busy? And how far out are they busy? These are two tools we use at Skeleton Key. The bottom one's fuzzy because I had to go pretty far back in our old recordings to find a picture of when we were so busy that we were six weeks booked. Um, you know, for us, that's like the magic number. We need another developer. This is a daily report we get, which shows if everybody's kind of getting their billable goal for the day or week to date. And we've been kind of using these in sort of a rhythm on a daily and a weekly basis to kind of keep tabs on our total productive capacity and how busy we are. Uh, more recently, this is what it's been looking like. Red across the board and way too much availability. And we don't really look at all this green sky. We look in the very beginning in that blue line. That blue line though, tells me that I've got someone who can start next week on a project. That's, that's tight. That's like really tight from a financial standpoint to have people who are that available. Because if that project doesn't materialize, you've got salary, but you have no income. Um, that tells me that we don't have enough to keep my people productive. You know, we call that the 876 report. You're here for eight hours a day. I'd like to know what you're doing for seven hours, and I'd like six of it to be billable. That's kind of our baseline productivity measure on whether or not you're doing most of the time what you're paid to be doing, which is development. You can see back here, you know, we were six weeks out 
maybe almost seven weeks out on when we could actually have someone available for what we consider to be full capacity. And so that's a time where like, you know, where people are waiting, new clients are waiting to get started. Uh, that's not a great situation either. The reality is, uh, you know, you're either always understaffed or overstaffed. It, it feels to me like it, it's really hard to find developers. And when you find them, whether they're really good or inexperienced or whether they're raw recruits, it takes some time to turn them from, you know, raw diamonds into sparkling jewels. And we like to keep them when we get them. So I'm not just because we're slow going to let someone go. I've never done that in the history of our company and we're approaching 15 years. You know, I just take a hit on profitability for a while. Um, so it's hard to find them. It takes a long time. I want to keep them when I get them. And if I could design a perfect pipeline, it would probably be always six weeks or more out and I'd always be forced to hire new people. And we just keep that hiring engine going. Admittedly, when we get to one of the states we're in now, we stop the hiring engine. And that means the muscles that we use for hiring kind of atrophy and the education we do around how to hire successfully starts to kind of fall by the wayside. And then when we suddenly have to scramble and hire again, then we don't have a pipeline of people to talk to. So just like I'd like a work pipeline, I kind of want a hiring pipeline. But the only way to do that is to make sure that the pressure is on the other side, that I always have tons of business coming in. And lately, admittedly, at Skeleton Key, we haven't. And there's a lot of reasons for that we'll talk about as we go. Um, so we've got a staff that's relatively idle. You know, we just did our monthly recap. We do a lot of financial sharing with our team. And we had a great July, but like, it was a standout in the year. It's the best month all year. That's not so great. I wish it was competing with February, but it wasn't. All right. I also recently, uh, in the last year, I think, I did a presentation for the Apple Consultants Network uh, and FileMaker, a joint presentation with iSolutions, I think, and uh, DB Services. And, uh, and my take was to create a couple slides just kind of making the case um, about, you know, where our customers come from and, and from an industry perspective and from a geography standpoint. Now, this is for my entire company because the IT side does Apple support. And so Missouri down here is a really big number because all that IT business is local, right? That's a third of our business. And so that's really why that's so big. But we got a ton of locations. These are all states or, or territories that we get business from. We have lots of clients in lots of places. That's an industry map. You can see we get business from a variety of industries, no matter how you categorize. And so we don't just have like a single vertical or a single geography or a single industry of any kind that we serve. Um, but even though we've got all that variety, we get all our leads from one place, the FBA partner search. I mean, I'm sure people find us organically on the web, but not because we're doing anything to make that happen, as I'll explain in a minute. Um, they do find a partner, and then they call us when they're ready to call us, right? And so we are highly dependent on the client knowing that they need help, or on FileMaker's partner search keep working like the way it is, and the number of certified developers we have, and where we end up in the stack, and where we have branch offices. And I suspect, I don't know, show of hands, how many people here are in FBA? Yeah, I suspect many of you are in the same boat. I at least know from the colleagues I talk to that even the ones who invest in more traditional marketing things or online or digital marketing things, they still admit that most of their leads, if not their best quality leads, are coming from the partner search. And when that thing gets changed, it can rock your world. And so um, I recognized all this and said, you know, we have to do something different. And the reason we have to do something different is because there's not an unlimited supply of people coming through the partner search. I hope that FileMaker keeps investing and the work that they're doing on workplace innovation and marketing is going to keep growing the number of people who come to the search. But, uh, you know, if I need them quicker than they're coming, what if they're not looking in my geography and finding me using whatever criteria they type in there? Uh, what if, for that matter, someone else puts an office in my backyard, one of you? And then now they're looking at the two of us and thinking they don't want to work with Skeleton Key. They don't like our name or our size or something they heard about us. I don't know. And then, of course, what if it stops? There was a brief period there where, you know, the partner search went through an evolution, and there was a dramatic impact, I think, on me and some colleagues on our lead flow. And then it got fixed, and it went back. But that could change any time. Like, FileMaker's doing that to grow the ecosystem, but they're playing an even hand. And so all of this kind of added up to, I need to do something different. And, I, you know, if I was smart about it, I'd have this kind of pie, right? All different kinds of pie, all different kinds of lead sources, all different kinds of ways for stuff to come in. As we'll see in a minute, a lot of that stuff probably comes in online. A lot of it's going to be digital in, uh, of type, but I should be doing events. We should be doing newsletters. We should be doing all the different kinds of things that people do to generate different kinds of lead flow. Some of it should be ge geographical and local to our office. Some of it can be online. But we need more than one, 
And there's really only one of all the different kinds of things you can do, I think, that puts you in total control, which is humans interacting with humans, right? If, if you are doing all this digital stuff and investing in Google and whatever else you're doing, you're still dependent on algorithms and, and traffic and behaviors and patterns of others outside to find you and your website, but um, you're not actually going out and physically doing something, picking up a phone or going to an event or talking to a customer or talking to a prospect or going to a conference. And, and that's really what this session was about. So I'm not going to get into all kinds of ways you should be marketing. I'm going to talk about the kinds of activities that humans can conduct themselves in, or I think they should, or I think we should, to improve uh, not just how well you are selling, but how much you can sell and how much you actually close. So I'll admit I'm not a marketing maven. Um, there's a lot of companies here. I see lots of faces in the room I know. Um, who are spending money on Google and Facebook and LinkedIn. They are doing newsletters. They are doing web campaigns. They are doing um, uh, all kinds of events. They're writing white papers. We've done some of that stuff in the past. I used to have some of my staff who did like, you know, the social media every week and every day, and they liked stuff, and they followed clients, and they retweeted the stuff that you guys produce, and, and I didn't make it a priority, and they didn't make it a priority, and we basically stopped doing it. If you look at Skeleton Key's Twitter page and all those things, it's like dead, like way overdue for a reboot. We also have gotten tons of advice from marketing strategists over the years about the things that we should be doing. Your people should be writing blogs and you should be generating content and keyword rich and yada, yada, yada. And I have tried and failed to hire several marketing firms and then I'm like gun shy. It's like I loved and lost. It's like what I say about my clients. They come to us after working with a developer who's not so great, no one in this room, of course, and, and they're like kind of gun shy about working with us just because they've been hurt. Um, and I feel the same way. I've, I've been hurt. So eventually, it's inevitable. I'm going to have to give up. I'm hopeful many of you know that this is the Borg. Resistance is futile. At some point, I'm just going to have to give up and just do some of that as well, because that will, I guess, uh, offset the single source I have for digital stuff right now coming from FileMaker and give me some variety. But there's also other activities as well that need to be done. So we'll come back to this as well as part of my next steps. So let's get into some vocabulary. One word, prospect. Right, so it's a noun or a verb. I'm going to use it interchangeably, but let's talk about it from the verb standpoint. When I first look up this word and think about this word, I think of buy a list and start stalking people, right? Call them, hound them, the same things I get. I get emails and phone calls every day, people looking to buy or sell something from me. They want to buy my company. They want to sell their services to us. They want to sell phone systems, IT, software development, testing services, developers, you name it. It's constant, and I have never met any of these people. They have found me, they have found my name on a list, they have scraped it off a website, if whatever, and they're hounding me, and I hate that. So I don't want to be that guy doing that. It's just too dark. It's not me. So I don't know if it was desperation or inspiration, uh, but I looked at this and kind of thought about it and picked out the words to me that were a little bit more hopeful, the ones that made me think about what this was really about, which I think is really about doing activity in an effort to change the status quo to some better future state, right? You can take it as literal as like the gold diggers prospecting. They were sifting through sand and dirt to find nuggets of gold. And so that was very hopeful. That's kind of optimistic. And so that's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to figure out ways that I could explore and examine, inspect and excavate the information that was available to me, the things that were more comfortable to me, in an effort to find gold, to find opportunities for my team to do good work, create long-term relationships with clients, generate repeat business. Uh, when I thought about this, I was like, well, that's not really cold calling. That's not getting a list. I should probably challenge myself to do that. If you looked at the preview slides, you would have seen that there was one where I intended to do that. Um, but I said, you know, I'm going to start a little safer where it's more comfortable. I'm going to go to this big, long list I have of clients and prospects who haven't bought from us in a while or never bought from us at all. When I did a quick search, I had like a couple thousand of them. These aren't just people who signed up for a newsletter or downloaded an article from us. We have that list too. These were people who literally said, we need help. And then maybe they made it to a phone call. Maybe they made it to a second phone call. Maybe they made it to a requirements gathering. Maybe they actually looked at an estimate. Maybe they even got a proposal. Maybe they just said no. But they were people who, maybe they bought from us and then stopped buying from us. And so I had this really big list of, of people. I just started with the people who we marked as lost or not ready to buy. That was the thinking, was that we either know they did something else, or, we, or they just said, not now, not a good fit, not good money, whatever. Or maybe they said nothing, because they just fizzled and stopped talking to us. And I wanted to start there. And my question was, you know, whatever happened to them? Did they fix the problem? 
If so, how? Um, are they more likely to buy from us because they kind of know us than they were to buy from someone who's a complete stranger? I won't be a complete stranger to them. They know our name. They obviously interacted with us on some level at some point. Hopefully they still remember us. Um, so that was my plan. Um, but after that, I said, well, there's probably a lot of other ways to prospect. And I talked to some people uh, who do sales. I talked to some people at FileMaker. I'll mention them in a little bit. And kind of came up with this list of activities, um, which I would say are all the different kinds of ways, I think, categories, use terminology ever you want. You could probably substitute different words here for what it is to prospect. All right, so if I really broaden that idea from just cold calling or just calling people who know about me in my, from my you know, lost opportunities list, what are the other ways that I might expand our business? Um, and came up with this list. So we got cold calling, which is basically calling people who don't know you. Um, you know, however you get the list of names to call. Networking, going to events like this and walking up to strangers and making acquaintances, enjoying BNI or going to like, you know, your chamber of commerce. I'm, I'll, I'll ask you everything about your family and your parents and are they happy and I'll share my life story with you once we start talking, but I'm the last guy to walk up and just introduce myself to someone. So that wasn't gonna work for me. Um, referrals. Asking my clients to put themselves on the spot and refer me to someone, uh, equally uncomfortable. Same with asking vendors and partners. Um, I just feel like I'm asking for something that they didn't sign up for. Um, no, hardly anyone ever asked me for a referral. I give referrals spontaneously to a very small select group of vendors who I really like and respect. And I do it when I see a friend or a colleague who needs that service. But I've never had any of those people ask me, so I just felt awkward. But these last four felt like they weren't comfortable. Salvage is the term I'm using for the lost opportunities, the not ready to buys. How do I go back and turn those into gold? How do I take all that junk and try to find something useful in it? Jump starting, which I'm defining as getting stalled or stuck opportunities that haven't yet been lost and making sure they don't get lost. So what are the strategies that we can use as a team to jumpstart those opportunities and turn them back into gold? Um, nurturing. So that's account management. What can I do to manage the relationships I have with our clients to make sure that I get repeat business over time? And then expanding. How do I take that client I'm working for and support another department, sell them other services, provide more than just continued development for that team of 12, 20, 50, whatever it is? How do I get into a large company, serve this creative services team, and then somehow make it over to the marketing team, and then somehow make it to the sales team and go wide? So I set out saying, okay, I'm not gonna do the networking thing. Don't have time with four children and scouts and all the other things. After work is precious time. But I'm gonna try that cold call thing um, and I'm gonna do these other things. And referring and cold calling to me are equally hard. Even though I know the people I'd ask for referrals for, it's equally awkward on some level for me because it almost feels worse, like I'm putting them on the spot. They're already paying us money and now I'm gonna ask them for something more. I'm gonna ask them to put their political capital out there with a pal and, and even though I know we'll do good work, what if it just doesn't work out? Um, but the reality is, when it came down to it over the course of months, these are the four I ended up actually doing. So when we come to the end, if you're a cold caller in here, I want you to please work up your bravery to get to a mic. If you happen to have a vertical and you're calling people about the vertical, that's okay, but ideally I'd be like to hear from someone who's cold calling people who know nothing about them, and they just said, hey, we've done something like this for someone before and we think we could do it for you because I have some examples of why I, I've heard that that would never work, and I'm not sure I agree, I'm on the fence. But we're gonna come back to that. I'm gonna talk about the salvage work, the jumpstart work, and a little bit of the nurturing and expanding we do, which I think we could do a lot of improvement. But I think there's some, some good examples in the other two. So now it's time for some stories. Um, we're gonna start with my favorite picture of the, uh, of the presentation, uh, which is, uh, I'm a wuss, okay? I, uh, I'm afraid of strangers, I don't like rejection, um, I don't like to uh, impose upon people, uh, it just makes me really uncomfortable, it makes me feel really uh, sick to my stomach. Um, so I needed a better way to do that, I needed a better way to jumpstart the process than to put myself into that weird state. I also had a lot of bad voices in my head. I had people who were telling me, um, you can't call someone and say, hey, are you looking for custom software? Um, I had people saying, if I was going to buy custom software, the first thing I'd do is go out there and see if I could find something that exists in the marketplace and see if I could use that before I'd spend a bunch of money building something new. Um, I've told that to prospects who call me and they say, we have a service business and we do you know, service tickets and we X, Y, and Z. And I'll be like, that sounds like 50 different pieces of software I know on the market right now. 
two or three of which we've consumed over the years, why do you want to build something new? You know, have you tried those? Have they failed? And I don't know, some percentage of the time I get people who have not done any of their homework and they're just, they like FileMaker, or they, they want to do it different and, and they, they're not really thinking strategically, I think, as a business owner if they do that. So I kind of empathize with that idea. It's against our whole business model, right? It's not about in, innovation at that point. It's about plugging into what exists. We as an IT hybrid company consume some of that stuff. Right? We use Autotask, in case anyone's wondering once we get to the CRM piece of this, we use Autotask, which probably none of you have really heard of unless you're in IT services. And it's a professional services automation tool and it plugs into all kinds of software that automates notifications and alerts from desktops and servers. And it's terrible, but we use it. This actually, I just realized this is gonna be on the web, but um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a necessary evil. There's like three pieces of software in that industry, ConnectWise, Autotask, and Paper Tiger, or Tiger Paw, or something like that. And, we happen to be an auto test shop, and, uh, and the software side of our business, we suffer with it because it, we build software for a living and we like to build better software than that, but they need it for all the other stuff, and we like all our stuff in one big pile, so we do. Um, but you know, people have told me this kind of stuff and more. It's already out there, it's a dwindling business, it's already been invented. Um, they're not talking about innovation when they talk about that, they're just talking about practical business investment. Should I spend $15,000 on a tool I can pay by the month by user? with no upfront cost to build a thing, or should I spend the next six months building it with you, hoping that it's gonna go well, right? Um, and for a lot of business owners, that's a big risk. Unless they've already gone down the other route and they've finally come around to it, which I think a lot, I mean, I would argue without any facts to back this up that half the customers we actually have tried that, or they know, having looked, that it doesn't exist because they are literally a breakout business. They are, com they are doing something that is a manual business, there is no software for it in the industry that they're in, and they're gonna be the one who makes it. Half of those say, well, we wanna take it vertical afterwards, and we talk them out of that, because that doesn't always go so well. Um, so I had to overcome this. And there's some really smart people. People have been doing this longer than me. People have been doing this and have much bigger bank accounts, who told me that this couldn't work. Um, on the flip side, I had a lot of encouragement. I don't know if all of you know these folks. That's Ryan McCann, he's the director of sales for the Americas. Uh, at FileMaker, um, he has transformed the sales team and the organization there in many ways under Brad Freitag. This is Mick Kleinick, he's the business account manager for the Midwest. You may know Matt Codling on the West Coast or Darren Quick on the East Coast. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to these guys and, and they are totally from a different piece of cloth. They are they're in software sales, they've been in software sales, they've worked at a lot of different companies and they are trained and experienced in selling. And so they had a lot of good advice to offer to me about what was possible. Some of these things are immediately uh, relevant to what we're talking about today. Some of these are just about sales process or about strategy when you're in an actual phone call or a conversation with a client. Um, but they were kind of countering those other voices. They were saying not explicitly that you could go out and cold call people, but that you could apply a similar set of questions or ideas whether you were cold calling or fielding inbound or following up on a stalled opportunity or following up on a lost opportunity. And so some of the things I'm gonna read them because it was hard to memorize. I mean, some I know off the top of my head, like time kills all deals. I wanna say there's probably signs at FileMaker on the wall that say this now to remind them that time is of the essence. If you let time drag on, the deal is probably dead. And I know that internally when these guys are talking and having their own kind of internal you know, um, huddles and conversations about how their own pipeline's doing, that's a challenging question regularly. Another one is why now? Why is this client gonna buy now? What's so important? This thing that they're talking to you about is probably broken and it's been broken. So what's the compelling event that's making them decide that today's the day that they're actually gonna spend 100 grand with you or 50 grand or five grand with you now if they wouldn't have spent it five years ago? Are they buying, are they selling, are they getting competition? Is their COGS or cost of goods sold changing? Um, is there a secession issue going on? Do they lose a key employee? You know, if you don't know what the compelling event is, if they don't have a good answer for that, I don't care how you found this client or how they found you, you may or may not ever close that deal. Um, a couple others were, you know, they challenged me to talk about the idea of being in control, like I talked about with the pieces of pie earlier, about whether you just wanna be on the passive receiving end of leads or whether you wanna go out there and get and make business of your own. Um, obviously they have a message about software leads to service, right, we've all heard that. Get the licensing sale, get started small, and that'll lead to more service over time. You know, I'm very interested to see some of the metrics. I mean, we, we can compare our licensing sales to our development, and yeah, there's a multiplier there. 
you know, but how is that inside the community? Um, but probably the most important one that I need to take and I need to figure out how to do it, whether it's me or someone else in my organization who I may or may not already have on my payroll, is that good things happen when you make live calls. You get on the phone with people, you talk to them, and amazing stuff could happen. Email is a great tool, and you'll see I used it effectively to get some stuff done with minimal investment. But talking to people like we're doing today is invaluable. And if you can do that with prospects and clients, it can lead to really great things. Um, it's awkward. It requires some guts to pick up the phone and dial. Um, and there's lots of people out there who don't ever take live calls. They want to talk to you when they're ready to have a phone conversation. But that doesn't mean you don't make the call, and it doesn't mean you don't accept it when they call you back. And that's a whole mode of communication I've been hiding from. But a lot of my time in email, and only when I was selling regularly and wasn't managing salespeople, um, was I talking to clients on a regular basis. And again, ones who came to us, so they already wanted to talk to me. I wasn't just surprising them. So I did, of course, the natural thing, procrastinated. So had a nice December, a nice January, got plenty of time to get this done. Um, then I did the next obvious thing, did a bunch of busy work. So I'd come up with a plan, and I'd gather some data, and I'd make a little FileMaker file, and I'd put time on my calendar. And then inevitably, something would happen, right? At home, at work, a skeleton key on a project with BrightSource, with my partner, whatever. It was, it was always something. And whatever it was, it was infinitely more appealing than this other work that I was supposed to be doing. Um, because even though I had all kinds of reasons, right? Pipeline, idle people, payroll, poor performance in the beginning part of the year, I had a tons of good reasons. I could solve these really simply. Call the client, write the email, advise the you know, developer, whatever. I could do those things. They were bite-sized. I'm a problem solver, um, so I could solve those problems. This other thing wasn't a problem to solve, or at least I wasn't seeing it that way. It was like a it's like learning how to exercise or eat well. It was like a change in habit that was going to take time and investment. And I, I, um, let's just say I have an audible book about the power of habit that I'm about to start listening to. <laughs> so, so this was a great way to avoid doing the work I needed to do for the session. Um, but I did do some of the work I needed to do, so let's get to the nuts and bolts of what I did. Um, I started with the salvage plan, the one I talked a little bit about earlier. Um, so I'm going to look a little bit at my slides here because that gives you the overview, but I want to give you a little bit more detail about what I did to try to salvage. And I didn't do it the best way, and I stopped after I started. Um, so I'm kind of eager to see where it will take me. So I, I went into my CRM, which only goes back to 2012 because we switched CRMs in 2012, and I didn't want to go to the old one, which was built in FileMaker. Um, and I, uh, I exported all of the leads that didn't buy um, I didn't even go, like I said, to the clients who'd been idle. Just all the leads that didn't buy from the beginning of 2017 back to 2012. I left the last year alone, figuring whatever I learned, whatever mistakes I would make, I would make with the worst ones so that I could do better with the fresher ones later. Um, I weeded them out, got rid of duplicates, got rid of any clients who had become clients since to make sure I didn't call on a client we already had. Um, in the, for the wrong reason. Um, I rank them based on how far down the pipeline they got. If you saw my session last year on sales process, I think it was last year, um, you know, we have a pretty defined sales process, and if they got that first email or phone call to us, that was stage one. If they made it all the way to a decision, that was stage six. And so I only took the ones and twos. They either wanted to talk to us, or they had a 15-minute phone call with us. They never got into client requirements gathering. They never got into estimates and options reviews. They never got into a piece of paper that they could sign. So I took the worst quality, oldest leads I could get and started there. Um, and I came up with some strategies. You know, like for them, we're just going to send a generic email. We last spoke to you in June of 2004, and you were interested at that time in solving a problem and uh, wondering if you ever solved it. Can we help you? I figured when I got to the better ones, not just the newer ones, but the ones that had gotten further down the pipeline, maybe I needed a more customized email that said, when we last spoke to you in June of 2004, you were struggling with inventory control in your warehouse and lost equipment. I'm wondering if that's still a problem. Something that might anchor, remind them what we talked about, as opposed to this just kind of bland, generic thing. Um, the, goal, the goal was to get those emails sent out and then have my team ready to field responses and when an opportunity presents itself, put that back in our CRM and continue on. 
but to do this kind of outside our normal daily operations. I got a lot of advice about how I should have started at the other end of the pile, right? The people who got further down the pipeline, it's like the difference between, I felt a nibble on my line, no, there's no fish, and a fish, you know, someone actually almost got on the boat. Like I should start with the fish that almost got on the boat, and then I'm more likely to close those because they already, I already know everything I need to know about them and I just need to update it. But I started here. Um, I had 319 emails I sent out. Um, I got an open rate of 36%, which is actually higher than an industry average significantly. Um, 56 bounces, so that's good for data cleanup if we actually did that. Three people unsubscribed from the mailing list that they thought they were being added to. I did get 13 friendly replies. That's about a 5% return on people who just said, hey, thanks for contacting us, you know. Um, that was really nice of you. Here's what's going on with us. And so there was business intelligence in there. They went out of their way and they stopped. One of them is actually at the conference. Is Molly in the room? I don't think she had a reason to be in here. But anyway, so that was really cool. Like, you know, they actually stopped and gave me a little update from like 2012 or older. Um, three actually became opportunities and two of them actually turned into business. One of them accounts for 16 of that 17,000 and change. So that's a 1% return basically on the viable leads. If you ignore the bounces, which clearly those people don't work there or the companies are gone. Um, that's pretty much an average, I think, for cold calling or other kinds of prospecting activities. I've heard that a lot of times. I have no facts to back it up other than anecdotal, but 1% return. So I don't know if I extrapolate that into the 2,000 or so leads we have, there's 90 grand worth of business there just by sending out this bland email to everybody. It was kind of interesting to me. So uh, what am I gonna do next? I'm gonna start with the more valuable ones, more recent ones. I'm gonna do all of them, not just 319 out of a couple thousand of them. Um, I'm gonna customize those emails like I planned and I'm gonna try to work up the guts to call them because at least they know us and or I'm gonna get someone to call them, um, maybe not me. Uh, we're gonna take the data and clean it up too. Those 56 bounces are really valuable. There's a lot that didn't open the email, so maybe I can find out what's going on there uh, and just keep repeating this. Once we get through the backlog of 2000, we've got all of 2017 and now we've got most of 2018 and we're gonna to try to create a process around this that's more rhythmic, like every month we go back X far and grab those 30 days and reach out to those and just be keep part of our process of generating leads, something that's parallel to the FBA search, right? Something that just kind of gives another stream of content just circling back to the old opportunities. And I'm, I'm happy to share the text of this email and I'm happy to get feedback about it. We spent a lot of time wondering if we got it right and if it was the right way to write it and I got advice about not putting links in there because that'll get in the spam filters and I'm, I could probably do a better email, but um, it was effective. The next was Jumpstart. So this is uh, identifying stuck or stalled opportunities and then figuring out how to help. You know, this is where members of my sales team have an opportunity or in the past when I had a sales opportunity and it just, for whatever reason, isn't getting to an answer. I'm not getting a yes or a no. It's like asking out someone to the homecoming dance and then they never reply, you know, or asking your kid you want mac and cheese or peanut butter and jelly and they just look at you with a blank stare. It's maddening. I just want a yes or a no. Um, and so we have a, a kind of a system here where I work with my sales team on a regular basis every week, look at the opportunities. In the past when it was just me, I would look at mine and say which ones are stalled. And, and for us, it was really about why is this stalled? Is this stalled because the client um, isn't interested? Is it stalled because they're putting us off and they're just too polite? Or is it stalled because some part of me just feels like maybe um, they need a nudge, they need a reason, they need a threat, they need something to get them off of like where they're stuck. Um, so it's kind of a mix of these things. The first items there in the list, other than the last one, are really all about helping out your teammates. Um, and I'm gonna give examples of that, and I have some results for that. The last one is really about that, that stalled, simple, hey, client, get off the pot or do the other thing. Figure out what you wanna do. So here are the results from just recent helping out my team. Um, one client, uh, about $111,000 worth of new business from this client, been revising an old system, developer's really great, very organized, he's actually one of our sales folks, he's putting together a plan to rewrite the system and get them set up, and for whatever reason, can't get the client to make a decision, so they're just stuck in this old system and they need this new system, and they're spending tons of money on the old system, but they really just need to get out of it. It was built by an old developer who's not around, it was not built very well, web direct, et cetera, and um, I stepped in and started talking to the client, and I provided some clarity about what we were suggesting, some of the pros and cons and the risks, 
I kind of tried to demystify some of the technical complexity because they were so deep into the weeds together that I kind of pulled it back and said, from my perspective, it's all about A, B, C. I think if you do A, here's strategically why that's a good idea and made it sound simple. And so now we're moving on the new solution and that's really helping our numbers. And in addition, that's gonna keep growing because we got hosting and licensing that's part of it. And then once we get into this new system, we can do a lot more for that client with a lot better return than the slog through the old system. That one was just a small one, but this guy wanted to talk terms. He wanted to talk payment terms, he wanted to talk ownership. He's a lawyer, he wanted to talk to the owner. He didn't want to talk to the senior developer slash sales rep, he wanted to talk to me. And so I had to make myself available just because there was that need. So there's a lot of those kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's just a shared vision to make sure that we're on the same page. Sometimes it's demystifying the technical complexity. Sometimes it's uh, negotiating payment terms. Sometimes it's just that owner to owner thing. But if you're not, if you're the owner, if you're the decision maker and you're not selling or you're working with people, being available to your team to help when those kinds of objections or obstacles come up can actually make a big difference. Uh, that's not a trivial amount of dollars for us and those will continue to generate hosting and licensing and continued development. I think that 41 is just the beginning. That guy's got dreams. We just gotta get him started. But it's, it was stalled for three months. The other one, we were doing development work but the wrong kind of development work. And so we just really needed to kind of change direction. The other one is that really simple email I mentioned. Uh, the simple email that we send out basically says, hey, you know, uh, this project is, this initiative we've been discussing is stalled. It's very generic. This initiative we've been discussing is stalled. We're wondering if it's really a priority for your business at this time. I hate to keep bugging you about it. So um, let me know if I'm wrong. Otherwise, we're just gonna put the ball in your court. And it's amazing to me how many clients go, no, 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 I really wanted to do that. And no, no, I'm really serious, you know, and they, they, I'm not dismissing them, it's very polite. I'm not threatening anything. I'm kind of asking them, is it really that important? Why now? And for the ones who it is important, where we failed to qualify that early on, they raise their hand and say, yeah, yeah. The most amazing one in here is client F. The day that guy called, my assistant said, no, that guy's never gonna buy from us. He's, he's squirrely. He's talking about like an old system in six that's like in mothballs somewhere and then the company's gonna get funding and it needs to be started up again and you need to help them, da da da, and it just seems like a real long shot. And it was, I talked to him and it was a real long shot. Like I, there was no scope of work. It was like X dollars to figure out what we could do to help you because it was a pretty complex system. And it took six months and I probably sent six versions of that same email out. I mean, it was the same email. After the second one, he knew what I was doing. Just saying, this is stalled again, this is stalled again. And eventually, it was installed and he re-engaged when he was ready. And, but if I had just closed that opportunity and put it with the other 2,000 in my backlog, I would have never reached out to that guy again, and I would have never gotten that business. And, uh, and that's true with every one of these, um, where it was just a matter of gut, faith, something about the opportunity seemed like, yes, there was a business problem we could solve, they saw it, they got it, and they weren't saying it was about money, they weren't saying it was about schedule, there's something about it that we could do. So there's nurture. Account management, keeping clients happy, doing good work, communicating consistently. We do some of this, but it's really informal. You know, the developers do this, the PMs do this. We really need something more like we have on the IT side. On the IT side, we have something called the virtual CIO. They meet quarterly with a client. They have a standard agenda, which they fill in the blanks. Recent projects completed, future projects on the timeline. What does your budget look like for the coming year? Workstations that need to be replaced, warranties. I mean, it's got all these different sections. How are we doing? Are you happy? Here's a list of open tickets. Here's a list of expiring certificates. Here's a, a list of all your hardware, all the different buckets of services that we provide and which ones need attention. And they do that over and over and it spits out project work. I rebooted our VCIO process for um, BrightSource uh, in the first quarter of this year and we have 200% of our budgeted services work outside our managed services. So managed services is like standard amount every month to take care of everything, and then projects on top of that. And we estimate, you know, X percent of our revenue will come from projects. We're at 200% of our estimate year to date on projects. In part, I think, because we just started meeting quarterly with these clients like we should have been more regularly. We were doing it kind of anemically, now we're doing it more regularly. We need the same thing on the FileMaker side. Maybe it's quarterly, maybe it's monthly, maybe it's I'm gonna to talk to FBAs who are doing this. There's several of them, some of them are in this room, who are managing accounts. And it is a way to guarantee repeat business. We get a pretty good repeat business rate, but it wavers between 50% and 70%, meaning that the clients from last year come back and do more with us this year. But that's just because they like us, or they have needs, or we're doing pretty good work, but not because we are trying to become part of their team. 
and curating the relationship over time and making sure that they're happy and at the same time saying, so what's your plans for next year and next quarter and which projects and you know, those kinds of things. So that's another way I think to prospect for business without being pushy and providing an extra service to your clients. And to be the trusted advisor that FileMaker mentioned in their video where they really have a reason to think of you as more than just a service provider but as someone who's strategically part of their plan. And then there's expand. And I didn't even like these words but I really like the sky picture. Um, we do this on both sides of the company too. What are all the services that you offer? So back in the day it was development. Then it became development and licensing. Then it became development, licensing, training, hosting, coaching. Um, now it's planning. Get to the end of this project, there's a budget for planning the next phase of work. So it doesn't become a question of is that billable or not. And so you have to know who you're selling to, you have to know all the different lines of service you're offering, you have to know who's buying which ones. And then just look for the blanks in the matrix and then figure out whether those clients should be buying those services from you. We have clients like that on the IT side. Are you buying backup services? Are you buying mail from, you know, office from us? Are you buying you know, um, uh, security services? How about a vulnerability assessment? You know, these are all the different things that we could provide you. And which of those are one time and which of those are on an annual recurring basis? If you want recurring revenue in your FileMaker development business, this is a really important one. This is, gives you the ability to expand what you're selling to your current clients by offering them a variety of services, several of which are recurring in nature. The other is about going wide, right? I'm helping you, you're 50 people in a 200 person company, why am I not helping the other 150? That's the question I hear on the FileMaker side all the time. They look at a company, let's just say one of the ones they talk about, you know, I don't know, I won't even bring up names, but they, they put one of those brand names up there, National Geographic, let's say, they've showed that at several things. I'm sh I don't know what licensing National Geographic gets and if it covers the entire company, but I'm sure, just like other companies, there's these really big companies sometimes behind the number of actual licenses. You probably have clients in your list here of 50 people, but three of them use FileMaker. That's a massive opportunity there for 47 other users who could benefit from innovation in their workplace. What are you doing to get it? Well, you gotta start with nurturing the original three, and there's probably some referral activity in there as well, uh, but if you're not a trusted advisor working with them in a capacity that gives you that opportunity to offer the services, you might not be able to expand. So again, we do some of this, but we could probably do more. It also could force you to innovate on what services you're offering. How can you package what you do during the idle times of no project development to actually provide something that you could sell to the client that might be useful? Is there some kind of support service? Is there some kind of training service? Is there some kind of update process on an annual basis? Is there a security audit that you could provide to them? What is it that you're not doing that all of your clients can potentially benefit for so that you have a reason to be talking to them about other services and can expand. So what am I gonna do next? I talked a little bit about it. Um, keep emailing those old leads, but with minimal effort. Start calling the more recent ones and get some thicker skin or get someone on my team who can do it. I'm gonna hire a marketing company. If you go by you know, the standards for professional services, you should be spending three to 5%, um, somewhere in that range of your top line revenue on advertising and marketing. Uh, Skeleton Key is roughly a $2 million division in terms of gross revenue annually. Um, so we haven't been spending our fair share of 60 to 80 grand a year or so that we should be. We've been spending three grand a year. So I wonder why we don't have that many leads, right? Um, so I've, I've loved and lost. It's time for me to get over it. Um, so that's a big thing I'm going to be doing. Um, and, and I'll probably get burned again, but that's okay. We're gonna start doing it and we're not gonna stop again. Um, I wanna learn about that account management process. In particular, I wanna figure out which criteria to use on who to manage and then how to manage them. I don't just wanna do what we do at BrightSource, and do it at Skeleton Key. I, I wanna understand how to do that successfully inside this marketplace. Um, and I got a few other, few other ideas that I'm gonna try and talk about it at a future DevCon, hopefully. So, one parting thought. Um, I found a lot of ways to do this wrong. I, um, I, like I said, I wouldn't take advice from me on, on exactly how to do it, but I think there's some, some good ideas, at least several that we've found bore fruit, um, and several that we haven't tried yet, because I'm a wuss, um, but we're gonna try them. Um, so now, let's talk. Let's have a conversation from the podium uh, about who here is prospecting, who here is cold calling, who here is doing something maybe like, uh, less reinforcing what I've said than maybe offering other ideas about what we can do. Things that require humans and voices, 
um, and interactions to generate new business where you otherwise don't have it. Please come to a mic. I think for the recording's sake, it'll sound a lot better. Yeah, as far as um, getting burned, I think SEO is another one that it's, it's kind of the Wild West. There's a lot of companies that, uh, that say they will do one thing, they take a bunch of money, and they don't usually offer much in return or long, a short return especially. It just doesn't work. Um, so I think, I think that's a very good point as far as like searchability being found online. You mentioned the social media Again, all the ways that you can get your posts redone and have that content that adds value, free content, people love that. I think that goes a really long way and it's, I think, really hard to ignore that anymore as we get more and more competitive. That's a great point. We have a, um, we have a peer group I'm part of. Uh, there's several of them in the Vomica community, of companies that kind of share best practices and chat. And the standout leader in our group when it comes to top line revenue, is also the standout leader in our group when it comes to his leads count. A lot of junk, but there's gold in that junk. And he's got a process for managing that. Um, and he spends more than his fair percentage of his revenue on that kind of stuff. And he's doing basic blocking and tackling. Like he did a presentation to us on marketing and it was like, you know, nothing anyone hasn't heard before, post, Create content, capture those names when they download, put them in a newsletter, write and send the newsletter, follow people, post things, amplify, 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 and it, it, there's not magic. And I've heard the same advice from digital marketing strategists that he told us, but we just haven't done it. And I could say, oh, I saved all that money all those years, but I look at his numbers and I'm like, no, nah, I didn't really save anything. I lost quite a lot, a lot of money not doing that. Are you leaving or are you going to offer a comment? <laughs> you want to have a dialogue, so I have a question for everybody. How many cold callers are out here? Yes. What is that, seven? Probably less. You're being generous. OK. Because there's unenthusiastic hands going up. <laughs> OK, so I'm guessing that of those cold callers, none of how many of you like cold calling or are being, feel successful at it? Okay. Oh, you do. Oh, 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 we have a hand. Yeah. Maybe you want to get him to right. mic as well. So I'm here. You said if anyone does cold calling, I challenge you to come up to a mic and I'm ask you questions. So you want to go to another one? So my real question is, does it take a special breed of person wired a certain way to do that? And is that incompatible with being a developer? Well, I think the... Uh, the thing to remember is there's cold calling and cold calling. So the first, I mean, we've done it a handful of times uh, over the past 10 or 15 years. And actually, it's, it's proved successful, well, out, call it a handful, four out of the five times. And I think the first, the first thing you've got to do is to think about what it's like to be on the receiving end of that call. Um, and, and the thing that we did was prepare. Prepare, prepare, prepare. I mean, we did that. We made our first cold call in about 2000 to a big company who, uh, they were way off our league of anybody we'd sold to before. But we, we prepared a pitch of what we thought they should be doing. We actually went, it was an e-commerce thing. We went, to their, we went to their store and we bought one of every single food product they sold, photographed it, mopped up a website and sent it through to them and then cold called them. And it worked. It works. We've probably, from those guys, earned about $5 million over the last 17 years. So I think it's, it's you know, don't, don't be the guy who makes the kind of cold call that you don't want to get. Try and be the guy that makes the kind of cold call you want to get. You know, somebody who you get on the phone who's clearly interested in your business, who's clearly put the hours in to, to do some research. And we've, you know, we've only followed that up a couple of times over the last... Uh, 10, 15 years with a, a very similar approach, and I, I have to say it does work. I think that's a great line that if I'm going to scrape anything from the recording is if you're going to do that, I'm going to just repeat it and I hope I won't mangle it. Don't be the kind of cold caller you don't want to get. Be the kind of cold caller you do want to get. I think that kind of preparation is something I never made the time to do. Um, 
I've got an example from the keynote that I'll bring up if time permits, but keep going, I think. I want to, I want to answer your question. Sure. Yes. They're not incompatible or they are incompatible? They are incompatible, I think, for the most part. So what you're saying, if I'm understanding Jeff, is you can either be a developer with all the skills and attributes a developer has, or you can be salesman. And it's difficult to do both. How well, do you, how do you call, how do you, how can you tell an introverted developer from an extroverted de developer? The extroverted ones are, have a microphone in front of them? The, <laughs> the, the extroverted developer looks at your shoes instead of his. So. All right. <laughs> I, I can feel more questions, but Bob has something. Please. Uh, I just wanted to say along the lines of uh, being the caller that's you know, the call you would want to get, I personally have responded uh, favorably at times to as sort of a combined email call approach where someone will email me and say, look, I don't want to take a lot of your time. I just think I have something really valuable to talk about. Here's in brief what it is. Can I just have a five minute call? And I think the nice thing about that is you know, I can afford five minutes if I see any value in it at all, if I think it's a possibility. And I mean, that's worked on me. That's all I'm saying. That's interesting, because I also got advice. And I'm not countering this. I'm just sharing something that one of, the, um, one of the mentors gave me, which was, you know, their strategy was, and maybe these are different scenarios, right? But uh, if you're following up with someone, maybe a lost opportunity or a prospect that you haven't talked to in a while, you know, his advice was call them. Uh, you know, maybe you leave a voicemail, but don't mention you're going to email them. And then send them an email, but don't mention that you're going to call them. Um, and I think the idea was, you know, don't give them a reason to let those two cancel each other out. Um, you know, maybe they never look at one or the other. Maybe they never listen to one or the other. I don't disagree. I, I myself have responded to, in fact, I, I start my phone call if I take that phone call with, you've got five minutes, right? Because if they can do it in five minutes, I'm, now I'm even more impressed like, they've just won something for me. I'll even go further into the conversation because they actually were being honest and they were disciplined enough to be prepared enough to stick there. Yeah, I was just going to add one small thing, which is unusual. It, it, it was against our thinking that the people who seem to respond the best to that are not the lower level soldiers in the organization. It's the guy or lady at the top. And they, they're probably not the first person you think of cold calling or sending a a mock-up or a proposal to, but believe me, they're the ones that can make time, and if they like it, they can make somebody else slow down in the organization talk to you. Right. So don't be shy of sending that, the, the email to the, the big guy or the, the lady at the top, because they're, they're, the, one, they're the ones with the vision to, to see what you're proposing. And somebody else is just, you know, I'll go away, you know, I, I didn't think of this, it's not, not my idea, I don't want to talk to you, but People at the top, they're, they're secure. They don't have that problem. They're much more willing to speak to you. That's in my experience. Yeah, and I think it takes a certain skill to set to develop to know who that person is. It's easy to say it's the boss, right, the president or whatever. But a great example, when, when that Valard construction example came up during the session, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my colleague Greg and I'm thinking, like, we built that solution for a construction company in Illinois a few years ago. It was a mobile solution, it exactly had the exact same problem. Supervisors in the field, capturing information about crews, handwritten notes, delayed to the accountant, three days of crazy data entry, um, you know, plus union and trade and all these other kinds of classification codes. Not to mention something they didn't mention, which is feedback to the supervisors on how they're doing on their budget and consumption of hours, right? Same kind of situation, except they weren't doing crazy stuff up in Canada, they were doing stuff like underground. And we thought, and even talked to the customer at the time, they were really excited about like, this has got to be a problem for all companies like us. We should call every construction company that does this kind of work. And, sh and I'm sure they have all the same problem. And literally a month later, I got a call from a company with the same exact problem. They sent me their spreadsheet, started telling me all the problems I had with it. And I said, let me just guess. And I rattled off what it was. And he was like, that's amazing. How do you know? So I was real inspired. Like, go get a list and call all those companies. And then I whisked out. Yeah. I have something to say. What you did, though, is not cold calling. It, because what you did was you researched it out, you sent them photographs, it was very targeted. And, you know, they, to, to borrow a phrase from the UK, they saw you coming, right? So that, that's not truly, I, I don't think that's a great example necessarily of a cold call. 
uh, a cold call is they don't know you. It's uh, completely, uh, completely cold. Um, someone has already mentioned that uh, you, sorry, Bob, I'm, I'm just going to use you as an example. You, you felt comfortable because the person in email said, hey, can I have five minutes, right? I'll tell you that cold calling, if you look at it as just one cold call, you're doing it wrong. Most research will show that people do not respond to an email, and you can ask yourselves this question when you're being sold something. It takes about eight points of contact. So the example that you used, that guy saying, no, don't, don't email or don't, don't re reference that with a phone call, m most of the time now that does not work because we're all inundated with so many messages. You just said in your introduction that you get so many, you get prospected a lot. So if you can think of your own self and to, to dovetail on all the stuff that people are talking about, what kind of email you'd like to get, what kind of phone call you'd like to get, think also about the volume. Even if something, somebody is interested and you know you want their service, think how many times it, it takes them to get through all that noise for you to hear that signal. Right. It takes at least four to five emails, maybe two or three phone calls. So if you think uh, in terms of, um, my answer to your question is, is it a different personality type from a developer? My answer is yes, because developers like to solve the problem and, and scope it, move on, right? The sales mentality is I've got to just keep making points of contact. It's a right. different skill set. So just consider that. And Thank you. Yeah, and we've got just a couple minutes left. So Jim, you got something? Um, did you speak? I came in a few minutes late. Did you mention anything about any value of certification and, and whether it's FileMaker or developer certification and other things and having that be part of how you present and whatnot when you get to prospects and how you present yourself on web, et cetera? So if I'm understanding the question, it's, the audio is not super excellent, is whether or not I... Um, Position our level of certification as one of the selling points when I'm talking yes. to clients? Yes. No, I mean, other than it's in our signatures, other than it's on our website, it isn't something that we point out. I mean, there will be times when I'm following up on a prospect and we'll mention, you know, how our company has changed and evolved, growth in the number of certified developers, advancement of our team, advancement of the platform as reasons to re-engage. Maybe it wasn't ready for them back then, Maybe the platform didn't offer the feature they wanted, but so much has changed and continues to change in both in us and them. But it isn't something that I specifically highlight. I'm curious why you're asking. I was just curious, um, knowing that you know, most of the FBAs here in the room here, if, if you don't have a lot of badges behind your name, you're going to fall lower on that list. Um, and for those of the FBAs who are new, if you don't have your certifications, you need to start getting them and, and keep up with them, and there's Absolutely. value in that. Absolutely, yeah, we kind of have like a bounty at our company, like the certification test comes out and like the timer starts going. Yeah. We want everybody certified within you know, 60 days because we want to keep our position up on the partner search. I mean, let's just call it what it is. That's, that's, that is a factor in the algorithm of where you are and where you rank. Um, and you know, there's a bunch of us there at the top and keep fighting for it and scale and certification matter. Yeah, and then a second, hopefully a short, a short question here. Um, Knowing, and I like how you've looked back over the years, you've got a list, you've got a process, you've got a plan. Um, are you, you know, if, if all of a sudden your pipeline's full, we just got two new projects and everybody's booked solid, do you like, oh, put the plan on the shelf, wait till we get a little, or are you constantly going to be dripping uh, against that list just to kind of, hey, you know, want to follow up? Um, we're booked out now three or four months, but I wanted to follow up and, and you know, I mean, are you, are you addressing your customers and clients in that way just to kind of get them warmed up for the time when you do have availability or are you waiting until you get closer to that edge? The plan is once we start this process up more formally to keep it going forever. There's no reason, just like with hiring, that we should ever mothball it for a period of time. Um, certainly when we're talking to clients, we use the availability for starting as a potential factor to incent them to start, but it isn't something, um, that we've been doing as regularly as we should. Thank you. Um, sorry, David, we ran out of time. But I'm happy to take um, more conversation in the hallway afterwards. Thank you for coming. Don't forget to send out your evaluations. I will send these slides into FileMaker, um, but there will not be any additional updates to this slide deck other than the one you just saw today. And that's it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>